Hello all, my name is Priyakshi and on behalf of EV Reporter and the team at HPK World, I welcome you all to this tech talk on electric powertrain testing. Thank you for joining us today. Electric power measurement is important for any automotive company trying to optimize and calibrate their electric powertrain. The aim of this webinar is to discuss the nuances of electric power measurement and solutions to help engineers overcome the challenges presented by electromechanical nature of the powertrain and accelerate the vehicle development process. Before we start, let me quickly introduce the panel for today. We have Mr. Mitch Marks. Mitch has worked in electric motor development since 2015, and he specializes in the test and measurement of traction motors and drives. He has been with HPK since 2017 as a member of electric power testing team. Mitch is based out of Detroit, Michigan, and he manages business development at HPK World. We also have Mr. Parthiban Raghunathan on the panel. Uh, Parthiban is country head and general manager for India at HPK, and he's based out of Bangalore. He has 20 plus years of experience in the business of virtual product development, virtual and physical verification and validation. Next, we have Mr. Prakash Stephen, Director of Sales India at HPK. Prakash is also uh, based out of Chennai and he has 20 plus years of experience in test and measurement. Uh, welcome gentlemen, glad to have you all on the panel today. In terms of event schedule, we will start with an introduction to HPK World by Mr. Parthiban. And then we will move on to the tech talk on the electric powertrain testing by Mr. Marx. The audience can put their questions in the Q&A box at any time during the event. Towards the end of the webinar, we'll have a Q&A session with all three panelists. So uh, without any further ado, let's start with a short video with about HBK World, and after which Mr. Parthiban will take us through the company introduction. Mr. Parthiban, I would now invite you to please share your screen. Sure. My name is Parthiban. Uh, you know, I will take about 10 minutes to introduce uh, HBK you know, and various aspects of that. And uh, HBK as a company, we are in the process of uh, empowering innovation and quality in test and measurement. We deliver value beyond measure by helping our customers bring a safer, more energy efficient and innovative products to life and much at a much faster rate. And from our president, Ben, you know, uh, his one of his observations is we see our customers challenged more than ever with the need to accelerate their product development and to make their products much smarter. And uh, this is our number one priority from HBK side. And uh, HBK, we are a global powerhouse in the test and measurement landscape. And uh, as some of you might know, before HBK was formed, there were two companies. One was HBM, another one was Brilliant Care. Uh, both, both of them, you know, were part of, uh, you know, and owned by Spectris. And in 2018, you know, Spectris and all of us decided that, you know, since we are catering with a similar set of customers, it is more appropriate to merge these two companies. So that's how, you know, HBK, HBM and Brilliant Care got merged in 2018 uh, and HBK was formed. 
So globally, we serve uh, roughly about 35,000 customers and uh, we are about 30,000 to 3,000 employees, uh, you know, across the globe. And uh, we serve, you know, 40 plus countries and with 500 plus customer facing employees and 300 plus employees working in R&D. As I said earlier, uh, HBK is owned by Spectris, uh, you know, an organization which is listed in London Stock Exchange. Uh, as per 2019, HBK's, uh, you know, the revenue was about uh, 480 million euros. And uh, both these companies are in the process of innovation for past uh, 75 years. So from HBK, you know, we feel uh, digitalization is changing the product development uh, in a various aspects. One, we see increasing data intensity. You know, we, we all see that, right, from our personal usage uh, to the level of, you know, the technologies, what we use in our companies. You know, we generate a lot of data. Accelerated product development combined with increasing asset intelligence creates data with greater volume, velocity, and variety. That is one observation we have. And another one is a fewer physical prototypes. You know, we all hear from the industry experts that, you know, they would like to, you know, reduce the physical prototypes and try to upload, you know, front load all their testing in the simulation world. So product creation is increasingly reliant on simulation and CAE, computer engineering, to enhance value in physical testing and accelerate development cycles. And the next one is product complexity. And we all know the products are complex and much smarter nowadays. Products and processes are becoming intelligent, connected, and enhanced through digitization. Similarly, intelligent technology, we've, you know, on a daily life, we see more sensors and robotic technologies installed. Converging disciplines, more physical parameters are being tested and measured simultaneously. Open networks, open cloud-based solutions becomes the choice of data storage. And uh, I know we'll also cover a little bit, you know, in the coming slides. And with that, you know, we see a disruptive potential of small and connected sensor. You know, we have categorized in a very, you know, various topics. One is sensor hardware. What our customer needs more, they need more cost-effective measurements as more things are measured. DAC system, flexible hardware or software and with a cloud-based approach is something is a, you know, a need. And data management software, as I said, you know, there are growing volumes of data from multiple sources, and uh, we need to manage them efficiently, easily, less time to manage. That is one of the critical need. Analysis software, easy to use, and uh, with packed with you know features, you know, advanced features, and simulation flexibility to accurately simulate various scenarios. Scenarios. And what are the underlying trends of these? You know, well, physical sensors becoming smaller and chip based. Software enhancing accuracy of measurement data, increasing the demand of smart smartness and smart sensors, that hardware becoming more modular and easy to use, and uh, more for powerful analytics, you know, uh, with the use of uh, artificial intelligence. From the R&D perspective, we see increasing demand for integrated R&D solutions. One is on the uh, sensor hardware. Customer needs uh, high accuracy and reliability and easy to configure. That is something, you know, uh, customer needs because most of the time uh, being a measurement engineers, you will know, uh, you know, configuring the sensors are most toughest, you know, job and time taking, you know, uh, you know, in your day-to-day -day work. And uh, from that system, you know, they would like to have flexible, reliable and accurate systems with a high speed and bandwidth. Data management software, which has a facility to interoperate from multiple sources and data sets and with a quick or rapid search functionality. And analysis software, easy to use. Again, as I said, you know, with a lot of features, advanced features and so on. Simulation, flexibility to accurate, you know, simulate accurately with the various scenarios. So what are the underlying trends for those? Demand for continuous improvement in sensor side, increasing testing complexity, demand for increasingly you know, sophisticated uh, DAC systems, increasing role of simulation. You know, simulation is taking most of the you know, part of uh, the product development and shortening the development cycles and more for powerful analytics. 
So while digitization is really creating you know a lot of changes and uh, you know uh, which is good for all of us, but still the real world tests and measurements remain crucial. Physical testing is still vital to qualify virtual and simulated scenarios or insights. The convergence of testing, measurement, and simulation is key to creating more usable and clean data. That is our observation. We as a HBK, as the product physics experts, we you know, deliver you know, valuable insights uh, through three main physical domains. One is mechanical, the second one is sound and vibration, and the third one is electrical. On the mechanical domain, you know, you know, we cater to subdomains like strain, force, torque, load, pressure, durability, etc. Just to give an example of our task, you know, weighing a bottle on a production line, you know, uh, to ensure the current correct, you know, uh, you know, quantity or correct amount is one of the example. And the measuring the strain in an aircraft wing, which is you know basically a durability testing, that can be one example. And measuring the torque generated by an electric uh, motor, you know, uh, driving a hybrid vehicle, that is can be one of our examples. When it comes to sound and vibration, we cater subdomains like uh, noise, sound power, sound quality, and acoustics. Some of the examples are uh, designing optimal car sounds, both you know inside and outside, and uh, improving cabin comfort okay. in passenger aircraft and uh, evaluating uh, acoustics in uh, new buildings like uh, auditoriums or theaters and so on, and vibration testing of satellites you know, before uh, we launch them. Electrical, we cater uh, subdomains like electrical signals, uh, voltage, current, speed, and temperature, and examples of a task, you know, uh, testing inverters uh, powering electrical vehicles. And today, you know, Mitch is going to talk much more you know, uh, in detail about this topic and uh, you know that will that will give you i'm sure that that will give you a lot of insights and optimizing performance and range of electric vehicle motors so from the domains i have you know uh, explained what we cover and from the product life cycle you know uh, we had bk proud to say that we cater into uh, the complete product life cycle in various forms you know, we help the customers in their research and development, uh, production, and we also help them in product. So in research and development, if you look at it, uh, you know, the physical testing, we deliver highly sophisticated sensors, uh, data acquisition systems, and analysis softwares. For the simulation and testing, you know, we deliver complex simulation softwares and simulator hardware requirements. From the production side, uh, we, you know, on inline measurement, we deliver highly durable, reliable sensors and DAC systems to maximize our production uptime. The similar way, we support our customers in end of line testing also. We, you know, support them with moderate, a high accuracy and durability sensor and DAC requirements for consistent quality testing. The similar way in in product measurement. We often uh, you know, support our customers with our uh, highly customized sensors that elevate their product performance and also sometimes they are part of you know, our customers' products. And uh, in service monitoring, low-end sensor, DAC, and software requirements, and for a sophisticated data analysis. So this is how we supply, uh, support you know, various you know, uh, uh, product lifecycle stages in, in, in a customer's journey. Along with this, you know, we also support support in all these uh, you know three uh, areas with an integrated data management, analysis, and simulation solutions, you know, which completely helps the customer closes the loop. And on top of that, thanks to our services and solution device division, which helps you know customers you know to build advanced technologies and advanced analysis and so on. Okay, what is our goal? You know. HBK's goal is delivering one integrated solution. And where we are today, uh, HBK today, you know, we are the world's number one provider of precision measurement solutions for test and measurement, uh, processing, and control applications. And we deliver reliability, durability, 
and signal processing assurance to the engineering community through innovative software. That is where we are today. And what is our aim and where do we want to go tomorrow? We would like to bring a unified platform for comparison of simulation results and test data. We would like to bring these two platforms together in a close group way so that that can you know, uh, immensely benefit our customers. And we'd like to create an effective hub that will enable the creation of our test-based models. And we are already in the process of creating an open ecosystems wherein you know, uh, multiple uh, you know, vendors can speak to each other and uh, the customers can benefit uh, by you know, using these ecosystems for any of their third-party connections. That is our goal. So our vision in three steps. One, deliver insight and confidence. That is the value that HBK provides. Second, to create outstanding products. That's the job of our customers and we enable them to do so. And the last one, to do the above in the digital world. This is a changing and dynamic world for both us as well as our customers. So whatever we spoke so far, that's how HBK will deliver insights and confidence to create an outstanding products in a digital world. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope uh, this uh, gave all of you a brief introduction about uh, who HBK is and uh, what we do. Uh, so with that, I will uh, you know, uh, request uh, Mitch to uh, take over and move forward. Yeah, of course. And, and thank you for that um, very nice introduction. Um, at HBK, we're, we're very lucky to have a, a really strong team here in, um, here in India um who, who's very passionate and um has requested me to be here today so I, I appreciate you guys joining um i believe there's a button for question and answer so q a i think it's at the top of your screen it's at the top of mine um so please feel free to ask questions along the way we're really looking forward to the discussion at the end around testing um along the way in the middle of the presentation today we're gonna have a couple poll questions um, so we'll take a brief pause in the middle to, to do some of those poll questions. So please participate in those. Uh, it's really awesome to see everybody telling where they're from. I, I don't know if that would happen in the United States. So, so it's really great to see the involvement. Um, but as Partaban said, uh, we will be looking in depth at electric motor testing. Um, you know, I saw a lot of people coming from, you know, automotive industry, obviously, but some more of the commercial automotive I think we have some really compelling um, things for you guys. So I, I hope you enjoy and, and please ask questions and, and get involved. Um, a quick introduction so you guys know my, what, what might be particularly interesting to you. So um, really quick thing, Mitch, uh, in the screen, what we see is a Zoom screen. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. uh, well, well, let's fix that. Uh, oh, I did. I, I thank you for catching that. I chose the wrong. I chose the wrong share. Perfect. Um, all right, all right. Thank you, guys, and and please pipe up uh, if if there's anything else going wrong. Um, so the the e drive power analyzer. Um, we're just going to go through what HBK offers on that front. We we have a very unique solution. Um, so understanding a little bit about what we do differently, so we can talk about applications and what actually matters to your job. Um, we'll go through efficiency mapping for, for really any powertrain and, and some ways to accelerate this. So how do we how do we do our jobs more quickly? How do we test faster? Um, we'll go through range testing and, and some dynamic power measurement, um, looking at you know how do we evaluate range? How do we understand how far the vehicle goes? Um, knowing that many of you will have rotating machinery test stands or dynamometers. Uh, we'll look at some test system integration for, for some of your standard dynamometer, but also looking at the future and what, what might be available for hardware in the loop. Um, very similar from our perspective as the measurement provider. Um, we'll touch on measurement uncertainty and, and to some degree sample rate, but mainly focusing on the measurement uncertainty. Um, and then I do have some comments uh, uh, for the, the people who are interested in some really in-depth motor things. 
Um, and the one one topic I see missing is I do have something on measuring torque ripple and noise and vibration. Um, like I said, it is a lot of topics, so so I apologize. Um, but we'll try to make it meaningful, and we can always go more in depth. Um, offline or in a separate session or in the panel, in the Q&A. Um, cool. So the, the power analyzer we speak about, and, and I do apologize for having this be a little bit of a, a product spec, um, is a measurement instrument. Um, it's one of these boxes. We have several sizes of boxes, uh, which allow us to measure up to 51 channels of electric power in one location. Um, this means for six phase machines, nine phase machines, multiple machines, multiple inverters, we can bring all of those measurements into one time aligned location. This is really powerful for measuring larger, more complex systems or, or characterizing several systems at once. Um, unlike many power analyzers in the market, we do can, uh, record data at a high sample rate for as long as you have hard drive space. Uh, if you want to store data at one mega sample for an hour, um, you are welcome to do that. Uh, we can take a lot of data to really do troubleshooting, uh, to get the initial setup, um, and to do more post-process analysis and, and understand our machines more de uh, deeply. Um, seeing that there is a variety of axle manufacturers here, um, one of the things I think is particularly of interest, we can support up to six torque and speed transducers. Um, so if you have a standard e-axle or if you maybe have a hybrid, um, you know, T-stand where you have e-axle with the, with the engine input, um, we can absolutely measure three, four, five, six torque measurements. So we did try to take the applications our customers are looking at in mind. Um, the electric power measurement card is, is probably the star of the show. Uh, it handles up to 1500 volts DC. Um, and we do have some future solutions coming out that will take up to two kilovolts DC directly. Sample rate is up to two mega samples per second. Um, I'd love to speak at depth about sample rate. Um, honestly, this is even overkill for electric power. One mega sample ends up being um, really the sweet spot uh, because of the limitation of current sensors on the market. So. From a bandwidth perspective, two mega samples buys you more than enough to get a really, really accurate power measurement. Um, as Partavan uh, mentioned, uh, one of HBK's core philosophies is um, high accurate, high quality measurement. We have industry leading accuracies um, for electrical power. That is another thing we could do a whole one hour session just on why we do electric power measurement so accurately. Uh, but please take my word for it, and if anybody has doubts, um, raise those, and, and I would be happy to talk to you about all the really cool stuff we do with calibration. We'll touch on that a little bit at the end of the presentation. For the people doing development, um, our cards have uh, a digital signal processor on board with user programmable math. But what this does and why this is important to you is that every calculation we do is done in hardware. We don't push anything over the PC for calculation. We do all the calculations locally. This allows us to cut down on post-process time. This allows us to cut down on the, the performance for the PC needed. Um, and this allows us to operate in a really um, closed loop automation system or a closed loop hardware in the loop system. So really cool stuff between the high voltage to the accuracy to the sample rates, very powerful. Um, we interface very well with HPK's torque sensors and current sensors. Um, if you know our torque sensors, you know that we do take accuracy and repeatability extremely, extremely seriously. Um, we look at our electric power measurements the same. Now, one, one of the things that was specifically requested of me by, by the team here is the interest in the electric and the mechanical system. In addition to the voltage and current measurements, we can also measure CAN-FD, um, accelerometers, microphones, temperatures, um, uh, high sample rate signals, all in one common location. So one of these chassis can measure a wide variety of electric and mechanical signals. So you can really understand from battery to wheels, 
how your inverter affects noise, how your inverter affects vibration, how it affects temperature, how it responds to CAN bus. So there's a lot of power here um, and a lot of ability to understand that mechanical system. We'll touch on that a little more. So I have a couple more slides just supporting what the eDrive system is, and then we'll jump into applications. So just supporting what I said earlier, what do we do differently? Um, HBK makes a really simple collection of electric and mechanical signals. Measure your battery, measure your inverter, measure your torque, look at your vibration, look at your microphones, look at your CAN bus, all in one common system. So we try to make it very simple to understand extremely complex electromechanical interactions. We measure very quickly and very accurately. Um, we have a cool thing called cycle detect, which I'll speak to you in a moment that allows us to test very quickly with extremely accurate results. So you can accelerate your development times. Future proof testing. If you buy one of our chassis, you do not need to fill it out and you can have two slots today. And if tomorrow a six phase machine comes your way, you can add a card. If tomorrow you need to do noise and vibration, you can add a card. We can simply expand to fit your needs. We can grow with you because there are so many unknowns in this electric powertrain space, different machine types, different powertrains, different configurations. Flexibility is, is key right now because we don't really know what's coming. Um, auditable testing, we store all of the data. We can throw all the data out if you want, but we can store it for hours on many, many channels. And we also make all of our equations public and editable. So you have the data, you know how things are calculated, this allows you a huge amount of transparency, especially when bringing up a motor inverter pair for the first time. You can troubleshoot. You can understand what's going wrong. When somebody asks you, where did this result come from, you know. Because we do our calculations in the real time in that digital signal processor, we can do real time feedback to control systems. We can close that loop. We can automate your testing more. Again, faster testing. And lastly, we, we have local support and training, and I know a couple of our support team are on, are on the presentation today. Um, really proud of this team. Um, they have done a lot with, with um, the local resources and, and I think have a very strong knowledge base local to India. So, so please, any, anybody out there, take advantage of that. Um, cannot stress the, the local knowledge we have. So we offer sensors software and an acquisition try to be that um, battery to wheels uh, analysis this is the worst slide i've ever made and it has haunted me for years so i apologize to everyone but the point being is we can make a lot of measurements we can measure your battery one or more batteries we can measure many inverter phases at that high frequency and we can measure many torque sensors in addition to this we can take your CAN bus but also accelerometers, microphones, torque speeds, temperatures, can, pressure, flow, force. We can make a lot of measurements and then perform those real-time calculations on all of these measurements so that we can feed it back to an automation system. We can also display all of these in our perception software and record all of this data so that the engineer can see all of that in one place. Custom displays, but I, I really cannot stress enough how simple we make it to understand my CAN bus gave my inverter a command. Here is the inverter output. What's the time delay? Here's how the temperature in my machine was affected. Here's how my torque was affected. You can start to understand that full measurement chain um, and do it very simply and do it in one common location with one data file. So we make lots of measurements. We try to make that understanding of if my inverter does this, what does my torque do? What does my temperature do? That if then type measurement situation. This is a screenshot from our software. Um, we store all of our data at up to two mega samples per second per channel. Uh, I can assure you we do have some faster things coming out to get us more into that scope realm of really looking at blazing speeds. Um, I'll, I'll leave that for another day. But um, you know we, we sample at a really high rate and we can see all that like a scope. You get that scope functionality in front of you um, to really, again, have that engineering intuition, understand what's happening. From that, 
all of our calculated values, we make extremely transparent. You see exactly what the time basis for averaging power or RMS is. You can walk through and see the equations for um, reactive power or apparent power. We don't want to hide anything so that when you do have discrepancies with your models, when you do have people asking you questions, you have the data, you have the equations, you can go back and say, here's what we measured, here's what we saw, this is why we got the results. It's all about that trust, that trust in measurement. Um, you know, we have the high accuracy, we have the calibration, and you have also have the data to trust these really complex systems. Um, one of the cool things we do is we calculate power on a half cycle basis. And this is one of the core functions of, of what makes us different. Um, so I'm gonna spend a little time on this, but this is what allows us to test quickly and accurately. So in that digital signal processor, in that computer that's on each one of our cards, so in hardware, we're looking at, in this example, you know, phase A current, which is in red. And we do some cool algorithms to identify zero crossings. So we say, okay, we have a zero crossing here. We have a zero crossing here. And I will spare you the details, but to accurately measure electric power, you have to measure on a, on a given time basis, which is these half sine waves. So we take every data point under this square wave. Square wave is indicating our averaging period. We take all the data points and we do our RMS calculations. We do our power calculations. We do our reactive power calculations. So every half cycle, every half sine wave, we get a result. This allows us to test extremely quickly. This allows us to not have a settling time on a measurement. This allows us to test as frequencies are changing. So as we're speeding up or slowing down. Um, this is cool. So we do this every half cycle. And then you might be saying, well, I want a, a really steady state measurement. We can average as many of these half cycles as you want. So if you have, you can choose to average on the rotational basis. You can start to get a really, really repeatable, really, really high accuracy measurement as fast as your dynamometer can change speeds. You can really allow yourself to test quickly and have that huge, huge confidence that you're getting a very accurate result. And I can speak to this at more depth. I can speak to accuracy at more depth. I think we'll save that for later and, and another time, but please ask questions. Um, this is super cool. This allows us to test really, really fast and get amazing results. So some other topics, and I'll talk about a couple of these today. Because we record the data, because we bring in those electric and mechanical signals, and because we have that user math, we get involved with things like vibration analysis. What does my inverter cause vibrations? Canvas correlation. My can value is this. My measured value is this. Why are they different? You know, we get into that calibration space, that motor calibration space. Um, DQ zero transforms and, and ultimately flux calculations. Transient torque and torque ripple. Our torque sensors have a very wide bandwidth. We can capture that. Dynamic power, drive cycle analysis, we'll talk about this. Um, in vehicle measurements, um, we're not a ruggedized system. We're not claiming to be, but we can do in vehicle measurements largely because of the cycle detect. Uh, and then we can do some cool things with live efficiency mapping. So this is a little teaser. I think from here, we jump into applications. But first, I would like to take a moment and pause for poll question one, um, which I believe the, uh, the, the team will be providing. Yes, uh, just we are just launching the poll one. I hope you can all see it now. I can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yes. Yes. So it's a three question poll, and we would request all the participants to please record your responses. So the first question is, are you currently testing EV powertrain?
The second question is, what are your challenges when testing? You can select multiple options. And the third question is, are you facing any challenges to synchronize electrical and mechanical data? This is a single choice question. We'll wait for another 30 seconds so that all the participants who haven't responded yet can record their responses. Fifteen seconds to go. In case you haven't still answered it, please do so in the next fifteen seconds. Okay, we're going to end the poll now. Uh, can you all see the results? So we have a fair mix of uh, people uh, opting for different things, different options. Very cool. So we have 83 responses, around 50% people answered the poll. Excellent. And uh, yeah, thank you everybody for participating. Um, this this is really helpful for just understanding going forward where where everybody in the room is at, and we have a really uh, interesting uh, spread of of different priorities. So that's that's cool. Um, and one of the things uh, that that um, you know really stands out to me is is that this industry is so new, and we do have so many people just entering it. Knowing what to test, I think, was the the number one answer for um, section two. So at HPK, please look to us as a, as a knowledge source because knowing what to test is a lot of the challenge for people new to electrification. You know, there's a lot of really good mechanical engineers out here who have, who have not had to experience um, electrical testing yet. So we, we really try to bridge that gap and, and try to be a partner for that in addition to our equipment. So um, with that, thank you guys for taking the time to answer. Okay. Um, so efficiency mapping, um, as many of you know, uh, efficiency mapping is um, something we do to understand at every torque and speed combination and at a variety of temperatures, what, what is our efficiency so that we can tune that inverter to get the best range out of the vehicle. Um, and in at HVK, we've we've made a really nice, simple um, user interface to map out what does your powertrain look like. So we can say, all right, you have a battery. We map a battery. This sets up all the power equations in the background. You know, we really set up the proper equations for um, RMS values for uh, uh, electrical power. So you do not have to. We then say, all right, in this example, we have one, two inverters connected to that battery. We connect one, two inverters in our software. Again, we set up the three phase or the six phase power equations. And then we say each of these is connected to a motor with two torque sensors. Again, we set up those uh, mechanical power equations. And on the screen, you have mapped out, what is my battery power? What is my inverter one power? What is my inverter two power? What is my mechanical power? And we allow customers to make these efficiency maps, these color plots live and store their values to an Excel type sheet. This is going to allow people to really, you know, when your boss comes by your computer, you can say, all right, this is supplier one, or this is our performance, or, or the, look at how, how bad this competitor motor is. Um, and then have these maps in front of you as to what's really happening. So we do try to make that easy, try to simplify things. So that's that's kind of efficiency mapping and, and the, the test point of it. 
But what's what's the real problem with efficiency mapping? Why does it take so long? So what we find is that people who are doing these efficiency maps will do them at a variety of temperatures. So let's say you're doing five temperatures because these machines get hot, these inverters get hot, and their efficiency changes with temperature. So we wanna make an efficiency map for five different temperatures. These inverters and motors also perform differently as the battery voltage depletes. So, you know, maybe at 100% we're at 400 volts, but at 50% we're at 350 volts. Well, we want to characterize these different battery voltages. So now we have this combination of temperature and voltage. Our one efficiency map might end up being 25 maps to really understand the system. Now, different people in this room, OEMs, tier ones, motor manufacturers, might have a different number of points they do per efficiency map. And we've seen people doing as few as you know 200 or 100 points per efficiency map. And we have people doing thousands of points per efficiency map. But how much time, how much time do these efficiency maps take if we have 25 maps at 600 points each with transitions due to the dyno with the machine heating up and cooling down? So if we take 10 seconds per measurement point, you know, we end up having one of these tests of 25 maps taking, you know, a week, taking three weeks of, of, you know, 40 hours a week, let's call it man weeks, or taking, you know, several weeks. If we can cut that down from 10 seconds to one second, so if we can use something like cycle detect to really accelerate that testing, you know, we can cut that time in, in a fraction just by testing more quickly. Because we're not only going from 10 seconds to one second, but we're cooling down less frequently. We're spending less time keeping that machine in that temperature range. Um, you know, we're, we're eliminating the potential for downtime. And if you look in the market, you know, a, a dynamometer runs about $2,500 per day. And this, sorry for using US. Um, but each one of these maps, each one of these characterizations, your company could be saving tens of thousands of dollars just by using a different measurement technique. So when we look at these efficiency maps, this is why we really stress time savings is, is there can be a direct savings of a lot of money for your organization and, and for ultimately your budgets. So we use that cycle detect. What does that look like? Here's an example of a, a sweeps test where we have a fixed speed and then we go through a variety of torques at that fixed speed, move to another speed, go through the torques, move to another speed, go through the torques. Here is 30 set points of voltage in blue, current in red, and then torque and speed in pink and green. Um, that we were moving through very quickly. So the dyno changes speed, we get comfortable, we trigger, we measure you know, half a second of data, we move to the next point. Trigger, half a second of data, move to the next point. We're storing all those datas, um, but we're also making it very easy to move through those test points quickly because we can test as fast as your dyno. Once you've settled on a speed, once you've settled on a torque, boom, measure, go. This is enabled by the cycle detect. And if we zoom in on, on a segment, what we can see is that, you know, for example, let's say we have a fixed torque, my torque is in pink and I wanna step through my speeds, my speed is in green. We can see our voltage and our current decreasing as speed decreases. We can see our power like a scope trace in the black where every one of these little spikes is a speed change. We can see our power to step, step, step. We can see our efficiency, step, step, step. And if we look at the time, every five seconds we're getting three measurements because we're testing as fast as our dyno can go. There's virtually no settling time because we use that cycle detect. We spend less time with the machine heating up. We allow you to plot those efficiency maps live. So by making those power calculations in a shorter time period, you can test much more quickly and actually have a higher confidence in your measurement. Now, one of the things that we can do to also accelerate because of the cycle detect is rather than 
measuring for a fixed period of time. So my graphic in the top, I have a sine wave that's changing frequencies. Rather than measuring for a fixed period of time for every measurement point, you know, let's say we measure for a fixed period of time, fixed period of time, fixed period of time, we get more and more cycles as the machine spins faster. Well, what if we said we just want to measure, you know, one cycle or 10 cycles every time? Well, now we can measure one cycle, measure one cycle, measure one cycle. And as our machine speeds up, our test speeds up. And just by cleverly changing how we do our testing, because of that cycle detect, we can go from having a timed basis to having a cycle basis. And we can save a lot of time because as the machine goes faster, we can take less time to make a comparable measurement. So again, that cycle detect allows us to test very quickly to get those efficiency maps very quickly. So I, I hope this sinks in. And again, we can take this offline in a different session, but um, the cycle detect allows us to measure very quickly and save you that time and money. Range testing and, and a little bit of dynamic power measurement. So when we, we test the vehicle range, every country has a slightly different protocol, but we all use drive cycles which are a series of speeds versus time that the vehicle has to do for a given torque profile. So here's a couple examples of, you know, the NYC, the US 06, um, HW FET, LA92, WLTP. These are a bunch of random names, but they indicate different types of city or highway or mixed use conditions. And these are the standards we have for, we run our vehicle through these, through these drive cycles and we look at the energy consumption. So this is testing that HBK has done quite a bit of. And again, it is because of that cycle detect. We can measure, and now this example again is a screenshot from our, from our software. We can look at voltages in blue, currents in red, track the cycle of those currents, and look at what is our power, reactive power, apparent power, as we're changing speed. And if we have power and apparent power, we can also look at energy consumption. So we can understand how much energy am I consuming? Where are the anomalies and where can I tune my, my vehicle? Where can I make vehicle level changes to increase that range? So we use the cycle detect here as well. And this is an example of, of a measurement from a drive cycle. So we have an instrumented DC bus, DC current is in red. We have the, um, the DC battery in blue. So we're looking at you know our DC bus voltage, our DC bus current, and then our power calculated on that, that you know that the cyclical basis. And we can see our power increase. We can see you know these little spikes. How do we mitigate this spike in power? This is what some of this raw data can help us with. Is like where does the spike in power come from? How can we minimize that? How can we increase our range with cleverness? And then we can ultimately look at the energy consumption and see how our machine, how our vehicle is consuming energy over time. Now, this was a start and stop. So we started, stop, start, stop, start, stop. This would be more of a traffic type pattern, but these are very real scenarios where we can measure. And HBK with the data, with the high accuracy, gives you a lot of confidence in this energy consumption. So, one of the challenges with these engineering range tests is that you don't just want to understand the total vehicle consumption. You want to understand how much power is my charger using? How much power is my DC converter using? How much power is my heated seats, my infotainment, all the other things in the vehicle? So we do have customers who are measuring, you know, 5, 10, 15 different electrical measurements to understand how power is being distributed. They want to look at the multiple motors. They want to look at the heating and cooling systems. They want to understand is suppliers one air conditioner better than supplier two's air conditioner. Can I change how my vehicle is distributing energy to save energy over drive cycles? So we might have many measurements where we want to analyze and make decisions on the components and the control. And we want to understand that vehicle energy flow so we can manage it. So what we end up with is people who are doing fairly elaborate configurations where they might have, you know, a DC bus with multiple inverters, 
with multiple um, HVAC units all contributing and looking at the energy consumption of each unit. And so I put this screen up here to show that in our software, we can map, okay, we have this many DC components. We can look at your 15 DC components and then record that for a full drive cycle, which could be hours. So we can record all that data for hours and give you that user interface so you can really understand what's happening or have more confidence with a technician understanding what's happening. So here we move to poll question two, and, and um, I hope this has been useful for us so far, and we have definitely some more uh, application related things coming. All right, so Mitch poll two is now launched. So there are four questions in this poll, uh, all single choice questions, pretty straightforward. And this poll is also uh, like a quiz. From the correct answers, we will uh, randomly select a participant who will receive a souvenir from HPK. So please record your responses. We can see responses coming in. We'll wait for another uh, 30 seconds. Ten more seconds. Oh. So more than fifty percent people have already submitted their responses. Okay, I can see more responses are coming in. So if we'll wait for another fifteen seconds. Okay, so uh, there is, we have 54%, 79 people have responded to the poll and I'm sharing the results. And also I'll share the right answers. So the first question, power is determined in half cycle and in HBK due to the correct answer is all of the above. For the second question, eDrive stores all data signals at 2 ms per sec per channel for auditable testing. This is true. The electrical and mechanical have to be synchronized only offline in eDrive. This is false. And in eDrive, all equations for calculations are public and user editable. This is again true. So thank you everyone for answering the questions. Yeah, thank you guys. And am I uh, good to pick up again? Yes, please go ahead. All right, thank you. Yeah, and thank you everybody for answering. Um, so now looking at electromechanical systems, and we just had a question about that. So, so I think it's timely to dig into some of that. Um, so I, I don't mean to give you guys a physics lesson. I'm sure many of you saw this in you know, high school or college, but um, you know, mo motors operate on pretty much all the same physics. We have a magnetic field in, in, you know, from here north to south. We have a current running through a conductor and we have a force that results from that. So force equals magnetic field times the length of the conductor times the current running through the conductor. This matters because if we put a DC current into a magnetic field, we get a DC force. If we put an AC current into a magnetic field, we get an AC force. 
And if we add a high frequency component, we get a high frequency force. Well, this very simple BLI force is no different than, than a motor. We have a current running through a winding, we have a magnet in the air gap, and we have a force just in the rotational direction. And our rotor magnet follows that stator excitation. So if our stator excitation has harmonic content, our force has harmonic content or our torque. So we really end up with a scenario where this, this electrical inverter, which is causing these three phase currents, is also causing forces that can excite vibrations, that can excite noises, that can affect torque ripple and durability. So I think it's really important to understand that this inverter controls the mechanical output of the system. And what we see is that we have our inverter. It makes a high frequency voltage. We see that in the blue here. We have that high frequency voltage getting filtered in the electric motor to a high frequency current. But we can see things like current ripple. These are harmonic contents that are going to make their way to the output torque. So while that machine turns current into torque and speed, that torque is going to have an inherent ripple to it due to the excitation of the motor, due to the construction of the motor. And then because every torque has an equal and opposite radial force, we're exciting the housing, we're exciting the stator. Um, so we're going to create these radial forces, which can be manifested as noise and vibration. But what I think is the really cool thing is we can make software changes in our inverter that affect our noise and vibration. We can implement active noise cancellation. We can implement different shapes of PWM to be more noise friendly. We can have a lot of control if we understand the if electrical and mechanical. So again, we come back to having that time aligned. Does my inverter voltage affect my phasing and amplitude of my noise and vibration? It's a real question. You know, is that torque ripple caused? Is it current caused? What is the source? We can start to understand that with data. So as an example um, of doing a little electric powertrain NVH testing, um, we had a device under test. We measured um, high frequency, high bandwidth torque, um, high frequency, high bandwidth currents, accelerometers and microphones, all into one of our e-drive power analyzers. Uh, we do the live display of you know, signals and FFT with, within the um, data acquisition software. And HPK has an extremely powerful NVH tool known as BK Connect for doing in-depth post-process analyses. So we made a measurement. Um, it was a pretty simple standard NVH test where we fixed torque. So we see my current fixed in red. We ramp speed. We can see speed in, uh, voltage in blue increase. And we can see our electrical power, reactive power, and apparent power in the purple, black, and yellow increase. Now, what I'd like to draw your attention to is the mechanical power. As speed increases, naturally mechanical power increases. We have our torque in pink. And this torque has a, a very, very, very stiff average. But we can see that at certain speeds, we get these little envelopes. We get these little torque ripples. We get these mechanical resonances. Um, and these become very real. This is a really high percentage of that total torque. And if you are not looking for torque ripple, you may not see it. Because if we look at our mechanical power, this is pretty flat. Because if you average on the rotational basis, you average all of those ripples out. Whereas we zoom into the torque in pink and we can see we have a big cyclical nature. You know, on a 200 newton meter um, torque, we have a plus or minus, you know, 50 or 60 newton meter swing. That's gigantic. That is noise, that is vibration, that is durability issues, that is eating gearboxes. So I put this slide up here to say, you can look at torque in a wide bandwidth. If you have an HPK torque sensor, you can do that today. You just need to know what you're looking for. And this type of torque ripple will affect noise and vibration. I also like to add that um, if you understand where your, your torque is coming from, you can do things to mitigate those noise and vibrations. Here's an example of a motor, and we have the high frequency voltages and currents. Uh, we have the RMS voltages in blue, RMS currents in red. And we can see once we get to a fixed speed, we kind of have that voltage dithering and, and increasing and decreasing at a 
two and a half hertz rate. We're ramping current at a two and a half hertz rate. We see power and reactive power ramped at a two and a half hertz rate. And if we look at torque in red, we see at two and a half hertz, we have a 50 newton meter swing. This is absolutely exciting to the structure. This is absolutely creating noise and vibration. I really like this example because the noise and vibration engineers made these electrical measurements. They saw this. They went to the powertrain engineers and said, do you have to do this control technique? Because this is a very conscious control technique. Do you have to do this at whatever speed they're operating at? This creates a lot of noise. If you make this you know, 500 RPM higher, we have enough windage noise to cover this. So these are engineering decisions where if you're an NVH person, if you're a um, electrical person, you can start to understand the other side of the house and have conversations about what's happening. Um, so my, I, I really like to stress, you can measure wide band with torque, you can measure accelerometers, and microphones, you can understand the system. Um, a couple of words on system integration. I, I don't have many slides on this, but because the eDrive system is doing all the calculations, so we're making the measurements locally, we're doing all the calculations in the hardware. This allows us to offer feedback to an automation system over CAN.0, CAN 2.0, or CANFD, EtherCAT, or we have an API, and that's feedback up to two kilohertz. So really high bandwidth feedback to your automation system. You can also control the eDrive system through LabVIEW, C++, C Sharp, Python, TTL, or you can do a complete integration over CAN or EtherCAT. This allows you to start, stop, trigger, change configurations. We have quite a few configurations possible. We can view all of the results in the PC or disconnect the PC and just operate within the control room. So some really cool stuff that allows us to automate. And you can take that thing like cycle-based testing and really implement it to accelerate your measurements, to test as fast as possible. On the same note, we can also test power hardware in the loop for let's say an inverter, or you measure a physical inverter and you have a simulated battery and motor. Um, we have communication profiles with um, real-time simulators. Uh, we make the measurements on things like an inverter and we do enable hardware in the loop because we offer that real-time feedback to things like the real-time simulator. We can act as a power front end. I won't belabor this. It's the exact same as system integration. We can receive commands. We can share data. A measurement uncertainty and sample rate, and, and I apologize, guys. I might go a little bit long. I, I, will, I might cut some stuff out, um, but I think this is important. So when we're looking at the powertrain, we have our battery, inverter, motor, and gearbox. And each step of this, we have inverter losses, we have motor losses, we have other losses. And we want to measure power to help us improve our efficiency. Let's understand where our losses are so that we can improve and mitigate those losses. Well, when we start looking at things like, well, what are my losses in my inverter? We end up having uh, what we call a differential problem. So let's look at an example. Let's 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 look at a differential problem. Um, let's say we have an inverter. It is a 500 kilowatt inverter with a no 95% efficiency. So we have this truth. And let's look at truth with a 1% measurement error. Well, our input is 500 kilowatts. 1% error means we're from 495 to 505 kilowatts. So we have plus or minus five kilowatt error. The error is 1%. I would put 475. 475 plus or minus 4.75, 1% error. But let's look at the losses. Well, we have 25 kilowatts of loss. We have to take five kilowatts on the input plus 4.75 kilowatts on the output to get that differential. So if we say we have 25 kilowatts of loss, well, that's 25 kilowatts plus or minus an uncertainty of 9.75 kilowatts, that's a 39% error. Do we really understand that the decisions we're making matter? 
And then we look at something like conduction losses and, and it's just uncomputable. So if we move to something like a 0.1% error, well, now we've run the same math, but now we have a 3.9% differential. We can actually start to trust this measurement. So if you wanna trust your measurements, you, you must know your measurement uncertainty. You must understand it. This is where HBK can offer some of that expertise. Um, I will not belabor this or, or walk through this at great depth, but HPK does calibration for motor relevant points um, to ensure you have the most accurate measurements for where your motor actually operates. So one, we calibrate on power. Uh, not everybody does this. Some people just calibrate on voltage or current. You need to calibrate on power because it's a multiplication but it has to do with the phasing between the channels. You cannot just assume an uncertainty. So accuracy or measurement uncertainty for power includes the reading of the measurement, the range of the measurement, the power factor, and the fundamental frequency. And one of the cool things that we do at HPK is that we calibrate across different frequencies. We calibrate up to five kilohertz fundamental. This allows us to do calibration for those motor specific points. You know, 500 hertz is not unreasonable. One kilohertz is not unreasonable. We calibrate at these levels. We try to let you understand your uncertainty at these levels. We also do that for power factor. We don't only calibrate at a power factor of one, we calibrate at 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. These are really hard measurements to make. We're very proud of how accurately we can make these measurements. Um, and I say that to again, try to give you the confidence that HBK can be a partner for determining your measurement uncertainty and for giving you the best, most accurate measurement possible. And while we understand it is a complicated calculation for measurement uncertainty for torque or for electric power, we offer a tool within our software suite for understanding the measurement uncertainty of a given operation point. So you plug in what your you know, voltage, current, frequency, and power factor is, and we give you out what your uncertainty percentage and absolute uncertainty is. We try to make this easy. We try to make it less scary. So this is a really cool tool. Again, happy to discuss offline. Um, and just a couple comments for the motor nerds, and, and I will go through this quickly, and please contact me offline. I've said that a dozen times, but we really wanted this to be a a nice overview because we have such a diversity of people in this audience. Um, so we mentioned the DQ0 transform earlier. In hardware, in that digital signal processor, we have the ability to do your IDIQ calculations, your VDVQ calculations, and we have the ability to implement flux equations. Now, I know all of you in your controller have your own special flavor for flux calculation, but we can implement many of them. And this is just a very generic example of us you know, taking a voltage, a current, a torque, a speed, calculating IDIQ for a ramp up, a steady state and a ramp down, VDVQ, and then ultimately the flux, which we could map if need be. So we can help you understand really in-depth insights to your machine. In addition to flux, we can do harmonic tracking and understanding of harmonics. So we can look at what is your fifth harmonic current? What is your fifth harmonic voltage? What is the phasing between our fifth harmonic voltage and current? And ultimately, what is the power of our fifth harmonic? So we can actually look at what is my harmonic voltage? What is my harmonic current? And what is my harmonic power? We can start to understand the losses of different individual contributing components. I think this is really powerful for understanding a machine and understanding machine control to analyze your losses, to understand where my loss is coming from. And again, we have our equations in the top right and a screenshot from our software in the bottom. Uh, and lastly, we, we can do things that, like looking at dynamic torque. Um, and here's an example of a machine running under 13 kilohertz pulse width modulation, nice sinusoidal current, um, torque, in pink, that's that's got some torque ripple, but nothing crazy. And then we change that control. We're recording data the whole time. We go from 13 kilohertz 
a six kilohertz. Our current gets all kinds of harmonic content and our torque goes crazy. We can again, analyze that electromechanical system. We can see how our inverter affects our torque or noise and vibration or temperature. So with that, I would like to thank you guys for your questions. I know I went a little long there, uh, but I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. And um, yeah, please feel free to contact us. We, we enjoy helping our customers solve problems. <laughs>